This is going to be part three of music in the Bible. We talked about music as a form of uh, kind of a festive celebration. We see that music used for that all throughout the Bible. And we see that in our environment today, our society today, a lot of that. And then music as a mood enhancer is what we talked about last time. And uh, boy, that really has a big part to do with what we listen to, why we listen to it. Some people just constantly have to have music going uh, to lift their spirits. And that's not bad. That's a good thing to use music for. Uh, but you just can't rely on that. Okay, because there's, our moods are going to change. Our spirit's going to have a, a, it has to be anchored in Christ. And our peace has to be in him, not in any kind of substances and, and everything. So uh, now we're moving on to part three. And this lesson is about music in the Bible, music as a teaching tool. Music as a teaching tool. And I've, I can't remember why, but I know that I've discussed this in some sermons before, uh, how important is it is to have music to help teach, you know, and how we learn things uh, so easily through music, particularly if something has a catchy phrase to it or, or just something that stands out. Now, I'm kind of, I'm embarrassed to share this, but uh, so a while back, somehow I came across, I don't know what it was, but this guy who was mixing country music with uh, rap music. It sounds like a weird mix, and it is a weird mix, okay, I'm just telling you, but <laughs> he was mixing these two together, and I don't know what got my attention on that, but I listened to it, right, and he's doing this YouTube challenge, it was, it's about this, this dance that he created, all right, the get up, now you're all going to go look it up and everything, don't do it, but <laughs> the get up, and, and he did this like online challenge, and all these people are dancing and all this stuff, and it's a cross between country music and rap, and I just listened to it out of curiosity, and you know, for the whole rest of the week, I was singing, that song <laughs> and it's like it's like go do the uh i can't even remember it now i'm gonna embarrass myself trying to <laughs> say it but it's talking about you know doing the hold down and and doing the uh uh you know but they that's always gone around those songs have always been popular the boot scooting boogie right anybody remember the macarena from <laughs> back in the day they're always these the twist you know twist and shout way back from the 50s and uh, it's always been like these catchy tunes that go to the top of the charts because everybody gets it in their head and they can't get it out of their head and then they're wanting to do that dance and everything. And the music industry knows that if I can get something to just jump in your head and stick, then you're going to remember that and you're going to want to hear that. And so I guess just kind of uh, before we even get started in the lesson, just kind of an application right off the bat is this. Music and the things you listen to, they're going to play a huge part in your thinking, and they're going to stick in your head. So what we want to do is choose things that are going to help us remember and reflect on the right things, <laughs> right? right? So we want to, like, we're just singing the psalms right now. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a lot of psalms that people are trying to put to music right now that I'm having a hard time. They're not sticking. They're not as catchy to me as, as others. But, uh, but, man, throughout my whole life, there's some in the songbook that we sing, Unto Thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my voice unto thee, O Lord? Do I lift up my voice? Straight out of the Bible, right? And that sometimes when you'll be singing that, and you realize, hey, I'm actually singing the Bible, and you stop and meditate on what you're singing. You know, so much of the verses that we've learned and memorized from the Bible come from songs, right? So, so it's very important. That's what we're basically talking about tonight. Music as a teaching tool. Now, let me give you a few uh, introductory remarks here. The Bible itself contains over 200 songs. That's probably a very loose number. I don't know. Uh, that's just something that I saw. It kind of makes sense, but it would be hard to figure that out exactly because how do you, how do you categorize all the different songs? How do you break them up, divide them into parts and all that? But the book of Psalms, of course, <laughs> is songs. That's what Psalms means. The book of Psalms uh, is, uh, is got 150 songs. We know that mostly written by David at least 75 songs were written by David. Some were either transcribed or written by Asaph, A-S-A-P-H. Asaph, we don't know a whole lot about him, but he was David's chief musician. All right, that's basically his job in the ministry of the Lord. Was He's like the music director, right? That, uh, it's not unbiblical to have a paid music director. Right? In fact, if you study... 
the, uh, the, the tabernacle, David, you know, the, the, the office of the people in the tabernacle, and later in the temple, Solomon uh, uh, put uh, into, in, into place, he put men whose full-time job was singing and, do, and conducting music. And if I understand right, 24 hours a day, there'd be somebody in the temple singing praises to God, you know. And I heard this somewhere, I don't remember uh, where, but I remember s somebody bringing up this point, maybe it was in my own head, I can't remember, but do you realize that, you know, I don't, I don't, that's not true, I was going to say, I don't know of any church that has like 24 hour uh, around the clock singing, but didn't you say somebody was doing that, like the, I, I, not something that we would recommend by any, by any means, but that principle of having just continuous song, but I got to thinking, like of all the Christians throughout the whole world, you know, somebody's probably always listening to or singing uh, hymn songs and praises to God and whatever. And I wonder if 24 hours a day there's somebody singing. There should be, right? We should be singing praises uh, to God. But anyway, Asaph, that was his job. You know, he's just a music man. And I've known a lot of good music men in my life, men of God, not called to preach. You know, they didn't feel like they had any special calling to do that. They still go soul winning, stuff like that. But they, uh, uh, that was their job is just to conduct... Uh, music and come up with things. Uh, other authors in the book of Psalms would include He Man. I love that name. <laughs> it takes me way back, but uh, by the power of great. No, sorry. <laughs> Solomon, Moses, Ethan the Ezraite, and many anonymous authors that we, we're not sure who wrote them, okay? Uh, how about this? The Song of Solomon, right? So they used to be called the Song of Songs. Right, it's like, uh, I mean, that used to be the title that people used, and, and it seems to be uh, very important of all the songs that Solomon wrote. Uh, he wrote the Song of Solomon. It could be divided up. I've seen it divided up into ten separate, separate songs it's broken up into, and, and it includes expressions of intimacy between two lovers. Don't, you know... I, I don't try to hide it. Everybody here that's ever read the Song of Solomon got uncomfortable, I know. <laughs> it's a kind of a hard book to read. I find it very interesting. It's not. It's a good book, though, right? And uh, everything in the Bible, obviously, is perfect, and it's there for, for a reason. But it's, you might feel a little uncomfortable whenever you read it, but it's showing us and teaching us that a love between man, a husband and wife is a, is a great thing. And then it also includes proclamations where on some of those songs, they're basically singing to, you know, like the lady sings to all the daughters, uh, the daughters of men or whatever, and she's talking about her lover. So she is uh, uh, proclaiming to others her love. And I got to thinking about that, about Song of Solomon. You can kind of divide up the singing that we do in that way. Uh, some of our songs are to the Lord, right? You're singing directly to the Lord. And then other songs you're singing to other people about your love for the Lord or about who the Lord is. And so uh, that's your two blanks there. Some are to him. And some are to others about him. And so singing uh, is that way. Obviously, I'm talking about singing as a teaching tool. So most, most of, uh, of what we would do would be about God in this manner. But sometimes we, uh, singing is used to sing to him as well. The book of Lamentations is actually divided up into five dirges which a dirge just happens to be, like it even sounds like it, like a sad song is a dirge, okay? And so they even, you know, songs, classic, if you listen to classical music, they even have dirges uh, that are just like sad sounding songs. And the, and, and the book of Lamentations is divided up into that. Uh, it's, a, it's Jeremiah lamenting for, the, for his people and all. And this is what uh, we started the service with tonight with uh, uh, Exodus 15, right? This is uh, the Song of Moses. Now, I want to break just for a moment, just because I think it might be interesting to somebody or whatever, but uh, let's look at our Bibles and go to, uh, you, he already read Exodus 15, and you know it's when uh, they, uh, the Lord had delivered them, you know, from, the, from Egypt and parted the Red Sea and then, you know, destroyed all the Egyptians and what have you. Look at Revelation 15. Uh, that might be just a, a, a coincidence, but he, he's, uh, uh, I mean, Exodus 15 and Revelation 15 both talk about the Song of Moses. And they, this is verse 3, and they sing a song of Moses, the servant of God, 
and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Now, you know, we don't know exactly. That's not, there's not a direct song of Moses recorded in the Bible that says those exact words. But I, I think if you read there, you don't really know what it is that they're singing. They're singing the song of Moses uh, and the song of the Lamb. You know, and we're not really getting the whole quote of what they're singing. So some say, I don't know if I have a blank there for you, but some say that it's Deuteronomy 31 where he talks about, it's like right before Joshua goes into the land uh, with the people and he's singing this final song or whatever. Some say that it's that. Others say, uh, you know, it's Exodus 15. I think it's Exodus 15. Uh, Psalm 90, we won't go there right now, but Psalm 90 is also considered a song, a song of, of Moses. All right. And here's the reason I believe Exodus 15 best fits the context, because if you look at this in Revelation 15, now just some real quick thing about prophecy here. God gives us all throughout the Bible. Look, in the Old Testament, he gives us the law and then he gives us Deuteronomy, which is like a second telling of the law. Right. And uh, oftentimes in the Bible, he gives us four Gospels. He gives us Matthew, and then you keep reading, you get Mark, Luke, and then John. You get four kind of different perspectives of what's going on. In the book of Revelation, I believe he gives us two uh, tellings of end-time events. Right. So you get uh, Revelation 1 through 12, and then it starts over, uh, starts over again there at 12. Uh, and kind of tells it again a little bit differently. I don't know if you know that about uh, the book of Revelation, but if you think about it that way, it really kind of helps out. And so this is a second telling of the end time events. And when you get to chapter 15, I'm, I'm going to spare you some time and just you can read this for yourself. But if you look at the events as they're, go, as they're happening, uh, this, when we get to 15, we're talking about actually the saints being raptured out. Okay. And when they're being raptured out, look at chapter 14, verse 16. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, uh, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out uh, from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the, a sharp sickle, saying, Thrust thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into a great winepress of the wrath of God. And you read that, and you compare that to what you read in the first, 11 cha uh, first 12 chapters of Revelation, you see the same thing, right? And what's happening is he's saying all those uh, that were the first, guy with the first angel with the sickle took up all the saints, believers, right now. Uh, this other angel is going to is, is got is talking about the wrath of God, right? And so you, you've heard the term grapes of wrath. Right? So now he's getting ready to pour out his wrath upon the earth. So in context, here's what I think. Why are they singing the song of Moses? Well, I think if you compare what's happening with the song of Moses in Exodus 15, what's happening? They just came out of the persecution of Egypt, right? And they go through the parting of the sea. And then when they get to the other side, boom, the wrath of God comes out and destroys the uh, Egyptians that are following after him. And it seems like, to me, that's like the perfect timing for the song of Moses. Because it's like, hey, what happened back there in Exodus 15 where we have the first song that, that's written in the Bible? Now you see this last song, and it's saying pretty much the same thing. Look, this is what's happening. God's delivering his people, right? And now he's pouring his wrath out on all uh, all the evil there. So anyway, I find that pretty interesting, but but I think that's what it's talking about, the song of Moses. And it seems as though, now we don't have, we don't go around singing and learning what that song of Moses is, but it seems like in heaven, that's something that they're singing, that's something that they're, you know, dwelling on and remembering, and one day we'll sing that song again, is an interesting thought there. But, uh, but I believe Exodus 15 is the best fit for that song in light of the context of God's people being raptured out of tribulation and the uh, enemy being destroyed. All right. We are instructed to remember 
and to recite things that God has done. In Joshua 4, 1 through 9, let's not, you don't have to turn to that one, but uh, there were landmarks that were set up. Okay, and God had told Joshua to have the men put these stones there. And then he said that future generations are going to say, what mean these stones? And you can recite to them all the things that God uh, had done. And so, uh, so we're supposed to remember certain things. And so these landmarks were there for remembering. Scripture was written, look at number two there. Scripture was written and posted around the house right, for teaching purposes. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 11. 11, chapter 11, verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 11. <laughs> All right, 11, verse 18. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for signs upon your hands and that they may be as frontlets between your eyes and ye shall teach them unto your children, uh, teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land, which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon uh, the earth. And so you see this principle, and it's all throughout the Bible, really, that he's saying, look, how about David? He said, I hide the word of God in my heart that I might not sin, right, against God. And, and uh, I butchered that, but you understand that's the principle. And so he said... Uh, uh, he's saying that you need to do this at your house, right? Families, you need to teach your children regularly. You know, nowadays, uh, people are sending their kids off. I mean, it starts when they're a baby. When the baby, it's like, uh, you know, I was just talking about this on the way up here because there's somebody here that we just, we just visited with earlier who is in Overland Park right now from, from Iola because their baby was really sick and they they're in the hospital and they had to transfer them to another hospital and i can't think about how hard that must be for the mom you know to know she was in iola and the baby's all the way up here and i'm thinking man i wouldn't have left right but but and i'm not criticizing her but i'm saying that our society has kind of developed that mentality that like that from the time that the baby is born i could tell you this firsthand uh i know some might use midwives or whatever but we valerie had to have c-sections for our children and when we were in the hospital they take that baby and if you don't know any better because we didn't for the first first time you, you don't even know what they're doing with your baby they just <laughs> take your baby back there you know and if, if they've gotten you to sign certain forms or, or maybe fail to sign a form or whatever they're shooting that baby up with all these shots and all that stuff and you don't even know but we've been brainwashed as a society to just be like well you know whatever you know can i have my baby yet no <laughs> that's your baby don't you understand <laughs> right and so uh uh, that's how we're brainwashed. So then they come to a certain age. It's like, well, you got to send them off to school. If you don't send them to school, you're going to get in trouble. So they're like, I got to go to public school. And then they go, you know, this is how our society has been, been uh, brainwashed. But what's the Bible say? Teaching them at home. That's a good homeschool verse right there. It's saying, well, as you lie down, when you arise, teach your kids the Bible. Teach them uh, uh, the word of the Lord. And, and one of the ways we're going to do that is by songs, right? We just sang some psalms tonight right put to music whatever uh and there's a lot of, a lot of time we read that and we memorize these different th uh, uh songs and we teach those to our kids i'm getting ahead of myself a little bit but kids uh pick up uh music so so well and so uh uh, but anyway, so there's, there is a scripture was supposed to be written and posted around the house in Deuteronomy 11. Uh, First Chronicles 16 is another place where there are songs that were supposed to be memorized and sung. Singing songs is a great way to learn and to memorize. All right. Now, everybody knows this, whether you thought much about it or not, but we all probably learned our ABCs. We maybe learned, if you ever took the time to learn this song, <laughs> the names of the presidents, right? The, the names of all the states and the capitals. Most people learn those by a song. 
You know, there are different songs that they learned so that they could uh, memorize those. And you say, well, I didn't learn a song, but I learned how to recite them. But yeah, but even repetitious sounds, you know, uh, uh, certain things. And let me just say this, because I don't know if it's anywhere. It's probably not in, in, yeah, I think it is in the next couple points. But do you know that in the Bible, song, it didn't necessarily mean that it was sung the way that we think song, okay? The song just meant like it's poetic, all right? And so they would recite that. And sometimes poetry just flows where you can recite it very well. And I love the King James, how, how poetic it is and how a lot of the phrases are very catchy because they're written so well that you can just remember that phrase, right? Now it helps if you can put it to music, right? But uh, I think of like, and I hate to even bring this up, but I, I, was, I was actually looking this online to see like the history of, uh, and really this brought in the rock and roll of the 60s. I mean, I know it was already around in the 50s and all, but, uh, but the beatnik movement, anybody know what that was? Beatnik. Basically, these guys were very into the arts. I mean, you go down to where uh, Brother Nick lives, you'll see these kind of guys, okay? <laughs> Even still today. <laughs> Repackaged a little bit, but kind of the same guy. Love the arts. They love the, the uh, uh, what do you call it? They're like hipsters and stuff, you know? And uh, probably smoke a lot of weed, right? Guess what? Beatniks did that back in the 60s. Smoking weed, throwing these crazy parties, drinking, doing all this stuff. And they would sit around in their kind of high state and they would think that they're waxing eloquent, and they would just recite these words that didn't really make any sense, but to them it made a lot of sense. And they're saying all these words, and it was just like music put to put to like uh, I mean not music, but uh, reciting words that was put to some music in the background or someone's beating on the yeah bongos or whatever. And so really, in a way, that also brought the rise uh, to rap music. So you say, well, that's not music. Well, actually it is. I mean, it's, it's not, I don't think of it as music, <laughs> right? But it is It is a song. It's a rap song, okay? And so uh, rap today, look, it's not all very musical. There's not a great melody to most rap songs. There's not a great, uh, uh, you know, it's not always so, so musical. But the reason people remember it is because of the way that it's said. And I'll tell you, tell you from the 90s, right? I learned a lot of rap songs from the 90s. And some of them I didn't even try to. It's just all my friends were quoting these songs all the time. And I learned them. They stuck into my, in, in my head. And so there are different things. Repetition, we've talked about that before. And, uh, and just learning words that sound. Uh, here's one thing. When we learned our ABCs. Oh, let me point this out real quick. So here are some things that would be good songs to learn. You can look these up online so easily. If you want to teach your kids or learn yourself, like all the books of the Bible, if you don't know those, that's how I learned the books of the Bible, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Letters to the Romans, first and second. Everyone's probably learned a different song, but that's how you probably learn it. How many learned your, all the books of the Bible by a song? <laughs> all right. All right. It, it was a different song than whatever I just said. <laughs> now, the Old Testament, I actually learned, uh, it, was, it was kind of a song, but it was a little more like just spoken. But some of the words, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, it just stuck. It's the way that it flowed. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. And so just, it was just reciting them, but it was in such a way that they, they, they kind of stuck together. And so if you want to learn the books of the Bible, singing songs is a great way to do that. If you want to learn the names of the 12 disciples, look it up online. They've got songs out there. You can learn uh, the name of the disciples. All the 12 tribes of Israel, they got songs for that. And then, obviously, if you want to memorize Scripture yourself, uh, a Scripture itself, there's songs that teach that you can memorize Scripture, you know. Uh, Stevie's were telling me about the kids listen to a lot of, what's, what's it called, King James? Singing the KJV. I don't know, are they trying to go through the whole Bible or just picking random things? or yeah? Because I was kind of wondering how they'll deal with, like, some of those songs that we've seen from, uh, from the book of Psalms. But, uh, but it's just somebody up there with the guitar, the ones that I've heard, I don't know if it's the same thing or not, but, and they've tried to put all this scripture to music. Some of it's a little more catchier than other things, but there's, there, it helps you learn scripture that way and, and, and uh, different things. But like I said, sometimes it's not so much a song, like we think of our different melodies or whatever, but it's just a way that there's a catchy phrase. And I was thinking about this uh, uh, in the alphabet. You know, a lot of kids learn elemental P. Right, elemental P, and what, what is that elemental P? Do you know they're trying to change that? Has anybody <laughs> has anybody seen that? 
Okay, so they're trying to change the, alf the alphabet song. Somebody is. I don't know. I don't think it's going to catch, all right? So I don't know if I can do it right, but they're trying to do... I can't remember. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's like L, L and M, O, P, Q, R, S. I don't know. They do something really weird. And you're reading it, you're like, that doesn't flow. Everybody knows L, M, N, O, P, <laughs> right? But L, M, N, O, P. So they tried to change the way that they do that. And they were like, well, that make it easier for people, you know, I mean, for kids not to get confused on what is elemental P? Is that like one word or whatever? So anyway, I'm just saying, but actually... I learned that. Like, I remember that. L, M, N, O, P. And then later on, I had to say, okay, it's L, M, N, O, P. Right? Sometimes it's just spoken poetry. Right? I, I think, I love what, we're, what, what people are doing with the Psalms, and I love singing the Psalms uh, whenever we have something that's put to music or whatever. But really, just quoting the Psalms is actually, in, um, is basically singing, singing the Psalms, Right? Just quoting the Psalms, but say, putting it to a melody makes it a little easier to easier to understand. And some of that might be like if you actually knew Hebrew and sang it in Hebrew, maybe it would flow a certain way. Maybe not. I don't know. But uh, so I love putting it to music. But anyway, singing is super important. And we've already talked about, you know, singing unto the Lord and how it affects our moods and how it does all this. But also, one reason it's important is just because you will memorize songs. And there are a lot of songs in the hymn. If you're not familiar with a lot of the hymn songs, it's a good idea. And I've said this before. If anybody wants a hymn, a hymn hymnal, just let me know. You can take a hymnal home. And it's good to be able to read those, those hymns. You know, Now, check the scripture and make sure everything is biblically sound. <laughs> but, but it's good to read those hymns and just memorize. There's great truths that you're, you could be reminded of throughout the day. And uh, maybe you'll say, where did that phrase come from? Look it up in your Bible or whatever. But, but man, music is such a wonderful thing. The Bible is just filled with uh, the concept of music. Now, there's one more lesson left in this series, music in the Bible. And that's probably going to be my favorite in a way. But, but it has to do with music being used just as a ministry, ministering to others and, uh, and obviously worship to the Lord. All right. And the fact, like I said, why did in the temple, did they have somebody full time singing and all that and the importance that it is in that. But I just want to uh, just make sure that you recognize the influence of singing when it comes to teaching. Not just that we ought to sing and learn more songs that help us learn the Bible and help us meditate on godly things. Right. But also that you eliminate some of the stuff. Now, I know if you're working in a secular environment where there's music playing all the time, it's hard. Right. Because you're going to have you're going to be singing some of those songs. But let's not fill our minds with stuff like that, that we mean, like a lot of it's wicked. Amen. And some of and some of it's just it's not necessarily wicked, but it's stupid. <laughs> right? You don't learn anything from like uh, uh, from the get up dance like that. Doesn't, that doesn't help me. <laughs> All right, but so there's songs out there that people learn because they're real catchy, let's make sure that we're learning the Word of God and teaching could be, I mean, uh, uh, music can be a great tool to help teach. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for music and uh, uh, help us not take for granted all the great songs that are out there uh, and just the songs in the Bible that you've given us and and uh, help us do what we can to get your Word and uh, and godly doctrine into our hearts into our minds that we might meditate on it and uh and keep it in our heart lord that it would keep us from falling into sin and it would keep us motivated to do the work that you've called us to do uh just the power of music lord that you've given to us help us uh help us recognize that and to use it for good and we know anything that you do good lord it seems like the devil uh, gives us a counterfeit and i pray you help us to stay away from the music that would uh, fill our minds and our hearts with garbage, Lord. Just help us meditate on the right things. We pray that you be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.